The following interview was conducted with David Williams, professor and director of medical illustration, the School of Veterinary Medical Illustration and Communication for the School of Veterinary Medicine, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, um, June the 27th, 2008, in Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank you, Tell Catherine. us where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. I was born in Muskegon, Michigan, to Donald and Arlene Williams. I had a brother, Greg, who was four years younger, and I have a sister, Kelly, who is almost 15 years younger. My brother died, uh, and my sister lives in Portage, Michigan. Okay. What about early years, schools, early years in school and also high school? Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I, grade school, I went to a Catholic grade school in Muskegon, St. Mary's, up until the sixth grade, and then my parents bought a, a home on the outskirts of Muskegon, and I finished grade school at uh, Sacred Heart uh, in Muskegon, and then I went to high school at Mus uh, Muskegon Catholic Central, okay. which was a, a very good experience. I still look back at those years very fondly. Tell us a little bit about it. What was it? What were activities that you were involved in? Oh, I played football. I played basketball. Uh, I was a college prep student, and th those were just wonderful years. I have made every every reunion but one, and the, it was a small school. So the what was the size of your graduating oh class? A little over a hundred, okay. uh, but but we're a tight knit group still, uh, even though the people have scattered. Uh, but I really enjoy going back for the reunions. We had one last summer. Okay, pretty really good turnout for them, huh? Yeah. Oh yes. Good. Yes. Okay. Then how about college? What, did, what was your next step? Uh, after graduating from Muskegon Catholic Central, I went to Muskegon Community College for two years and got an Associate of Arts degree at uh, MCC. And then I thought I was going to play football at Central Michigan University. And I went to Central Michigan for a very short time and then left school and uh, I had an old car that I sold to a friend for $275, which was enough to get me on a Greyhound from Muskegon to New York City. And then I got on a ship in New York and sailed to uh, Europe. And I lived in Hamburg, Germany for a year and worked in a plexiglass factory. Then I came back. What prompted you to decide to do that? Well, it was a romantic interest. Okay. I had met a, a girl uh, a few years before, uh, a German girl who had been over as an exchange student, uh, and just wanted to see Edith. So I okay. went back to Hamburg, or went to Hamburg. And that was in the Vietnam era. Vietnam was just sort of getting started, and the Army asked me to come back and take a physical, which I did. And I decided, at first I was going to just go in the Army, because I thought I'd have the GI Bill after serving to help with college. But I changed my mind and drove down to East Lansing. I borrowed my father's car, threw my clothes in the back of his car, drove down to East Lansing, and got myself admitted at Michigan State University. And okay. that's where I uh, received my bachelor's degree. Okay. What, year, what year did you graduate from there? Uh, 1966. Okay. Tell us about campus life. What activity, did you, were you involved in athletics at all there? Not at Michigan State. Okay. Uh, Catherine, I, I Finances were difficult for me, uh, and so I held down a number of jobs. I worked in the cyclotron lab, I worked at Sears, I worked a lot. So there wasn't a lot of, plus I had missed, essentially had missed my junior year of college. And for some reason I just still wanted to graduate on time. So I essentially took my junior and my senior year in that one year so that I could still graduate in June of 66. So mm -hmm. I, I was very busy. What was your major in college? I was a pre-med student uh, with an art major. That's an co interesting combination. It is, uh, because I had already learned a little bit about medical illustration, but I thought that I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. There was a TV, very popular TV show at that time called Ben Casey, and uh, I, I really thought that I wanted to be a neurosurgeon, so I, that, that was why I was pre-med. I was, I, I was also pre-med at Muskegon Community College, but I'd always enjoyed art, uh, 
and had learned about medical illustration from a professor at the University of Michigan. And that was always sort of in the background, but I couldn't imagine being able to make a living as an artist. So it was just something that I did. Okay, okay. Then well, uh, when you finished, what, what did you, what, what was the next step? after you finished uh, Michigan State? After I graduated from Michigan State, I studied uh, uh, medical illustration at uh, the Medical College of Georgia. Did they uh, have a large department there? Oh, or? no. Oh. Medical illustration uh, is studied on the graduate level, and it's a very, very unique field for many reasons, one being uh, that there are only a handful of students. We have five graduate programs in the country at this time that are accredited. Um, and so I studied medical illustration at the Medical College of Georgia. Mm -hmm. And then when you finished that, what, uh, what happened to the med school? You were pre-med. Had you decided to move in that area? I, or I go on I, with I, the illustration? I, I think right. that the, I knew before I graduated from Michigan State that I did not have the grades that would get me into medical school. And surprisingly, I applied to the Medical College of Georgia's program in medical illustration, and I, I was accepted without an interview. I was accepted just on the sure. basis of my work. So uh, that, that's okay. how that happened. Then you, when you finished that uh, program there, what did you come back to Michigan? And yes. Okay. And, and, uh, that, and met my wife, uh, or the person who became my wife, uh -huh. in, in my hometown in Muskegon. She was teaching. And... Uh, we married, uh, it'll be our 40th anniversary on September 2nd of this year. Okay, good. Then was, would, uh, was your career path before you came to Purdue, you stayed at Michigan State and then came? Actually, actually yes, after I finished studying medical illustration, I went back to Michigan State mm -hmm. and I worked in the anatomy department for a number of years. Um, and then after Andrea and I were married, uh, I was at the Medical co uh, the College of Human Medicine at Michigan State for three years, uh, up until 1973, and then I came to Purdue. How did February you? February 1 of 1973. Uh, how did you get the off? Uh, how did you happen to come to Purdue? What was the off? Uh, how did, you, did you learn about? Was there a vacancy or? Yes, I saw a job posting at a meeting in St. Louis, and. Uh, I, I think the idea of still going to medical school was there, and I was uh, thinking about trying to get into the medical school at Michigan State University at the same time that I came to Purdue and, and interviewed for the job. And Jack Stockton was the dean of the veterinary. The, the position was in the veterinary school. Okay. Uh, and there were certain things about the position that were attractive to me. And Jack Stockton had been the head of microbiology at Michigan State uh, for several years before he came to Purdue, and I remember asking him to compare the two schools because I really had no idea. Uh, in fact, when I came for the interview, I wasn't even sure where Purdue was. I had to look on a map to locate it. We'd, been play we'd played them a football many times, but I, when it came right down to it, I didn't know for sure where Purdue was located. And I remember Jack said Mich at Michigan State, anything goes. Purdue is run like a really a much tighter ship and uh, and I think that certainly is I found that to be the case. So as things turned out I, I was offered the position at Purdue and uh, decided to accept it. I, I felt it, I very much wanted to be an academic uh, and be uh, have the possibility of becoming a full professor. I, I think that I'm the only full professor of medical illustration perhaps in the world. Uh, and I, I thought that I had that opportunity at Purdue. And that was one of the primary motivating factors in accepting the position. Good. Tell us a little bit about the department when, when you came. It had already been established though. And yes. Al, Al Allen? Or? Al Allen had, was one of the first, uh, uh, one of the first faculty members hired. The, the, the veterinary school at Purdue was started in 1959. It grew out of the old animal science department in the College, College of uh, Agriculture. Uh, and Al was one of the first uh, faculty hired. He was had just graduated also from the Medical College of Georgia in medical illustration. 
and he started the Department of Medical Illustration at the veterinary school. Mm -hmm. and, and he really is the person who hired me. Right. Was that a first? Were there other, medic or other vet schools at that time that had a similar department? I don't know for sure, but I would sense that uh, it would be my sense that Purdue, and what, what, certainly what Al Allen did, which was a lot more than just traditional medical illustration, was unique at Purdue. Uh -huh. Cornell uh, had m medical artists, but certainly nothing like w what Purdue had at that time. Right. Okay. Now, so you're on the staff. Tell us a little about medical illustration and uh, what are the depart what kinds of things you were involved in uh, while you were here for our researchers. And expand on that and how the department has grown. And oh yes. Uh, the, the real name of the department is Medical Illustration and Communications. And Al, while he was a trained uh, medical artist, was uh, very gifted in other areas of communication. Uh, in comparison, I'm much more of a traditional medical artist. I, I, I have always enjoyed very much creating, the, the whole process of creating m detailed medical art. Al was, I think it's fair to say, more uh, interested in, in audiovisual uh, television. He was a pioneer in the use of television for teaching purposes, videotapes. Um, we had an auditorial laboratory in our school. Uh, our first librarian, Ann Kirker, uh, uh, teamed up with Al to get a grant about the time that I came to Purdue that allowed them to establish our, our uh, AT lab. Mm -hmm which was unique at that time for veterinary schools. Was that used for teaching purposes? Is that what the, the yes. tapes were? Yes, okay. and we had a TV studio in, in the veterinary school, and, and we would actually do, uh, the surgeons would actually do surgeries in, in the TV studio. We would videotape those and then edit them and put those then in the AT lab for the students to... To look at. To view. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. But and there were slide, carousel slides, uh, all, all the stuff that's you know, no longer used, but at the time was state of the art. There, there were people that came from several veterinary schools around the country to see what we were doing, and then mm -hmm. we were emulated. The illustrations that you worked with, did you work with the faculty? Is that, uh, tell us, a little, you know, that was your contact? And Yes, primarily okay. with, with my colleagues. Um, for instance, if you had your own unique way of, of, of doing a certain surgical procedure, uh, we, we could do it a number of ways. You could describe what it is that you uh, do, and I like to say that because of uh, having a, what I call a dynamic knowledge of anatomy, uh, after you've, or while you're telling me what it is that you're wanting to have illustrated, I'll see a picture in my head, or a series of pictures, and then it's just a matter of getting those pictures in my head onto a, onto a piece of paper. And, th and that's where that creative process flows, but it's already started in my head because I see the picture. And mm -hmm. that's where what I've always referred to as having a knowledge of dynamic anatomy, knowing where certain structures, what, what's in front of something, what's behind, and it, it, it allows you to do that. Where I struggled when I came to Purdue was medical illustration, by and large, is studied on the human level. And so all of my training had been on the human level. I, I had taken uh, gross anatomy twice uh, and had dissected two human cadavers. And I used to jokingly say the closest I'd been to a cow was driving by one on a highway. <laughs> so when I came, I really didn't uh, have that dynamic knowledge. And now anatomy is anatomy is anatomy to a point but I really didn't have a dynamic knowledge of uh, animal anatomy, and that I had to Beef up. sort of learn on the job, so to speak. Right. So I spent a lot of time in our, our gross anatomy lab at the veterinary school, so much so that when I went on my first sabbatical, my initial plan was to go to Cornell and begin work on a master's in uh, uh, gross anatomy, veterinary gross anatomy. And it's a long story, but for a lot of reasons that did not work out, and I wound up going to uh, 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 Munich, Germany for a year. 
and, and had an experience that I never dreamed I would have. And it, it really was a much, and it ch really changed the course of my academic career, changed the course of my life in many ways. In what way, would you say? You well, that was, <laughs> I what, have. What was the affiliation? What were you doing over there? I, I have always had uh, an interest in the history of art in, anat in, in medicine, but especially anatomy. Uh, I think I'm, well, I don't think I know, I'm a frustrated would-be historian. And if I had to do things all over again, and there were times when I came very close to doing it, I would get a PhD in, in the history of medicine. But many people who work in the field or the, in the area of the history of medicine are able to create a niche for themselves without necessarily having credentials. Uh, there are people like myself, there are librarians, there are all kinds of people who work in the area of the history of medicine. So I had always had this intellectual interest in, in the history of art in medicine, especially anatomy. And when I was uh, in graduate school studying medical illustration, I became familiar with a certain anatomical atlas that had been created in Vienna, uh, both before, during, and after the Second World War. And most people view this atlas as the pinnacle of anatomical illustration. The, the, the paintings that make up this atlas, the paintings of the dissections, are just masterpieces. So I, 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 the first time I saw the book, I just fell in love with it. Where is the book housed? Uh, well, now, that, that, that's a difficult question to answer because oh. I, I would have to tell the whole story oh, of, 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 of the origin of that book. The, the, the book uh, has, uh, Purdue has a copy of, of that book, but it's no longer on the shelf. Uh, and although there may be a copy in, in the uh, undergraduate library, um, uh, when the book came into the United States in 1962, uh, it came in not, the original atlas was seven volumes that had a very, it had the illustrations along with a very pedantic text that had been prepared by the creator of the atlas. When it came into the United States in 1962, uh, the publisher had had made it a true atlas. They had, they had eliminated the text and just had the illustrations, and had uh, 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 legends written by Dr. Munson at the University of Illinois, and it was a big hit. A lot of surgeons, especially head and neck surgeons, started to use this atlas. But gradually, rumors began to circulate about the origin of the cadavers that had been used for these dissections. And one of the artists, if you looked very carefully, uh, you could see one of the painters had a, a way of signing, his name was Eric Lepier, L-E-P-I-E-R. He had a way of signing Lepier, and then he would, at the end, he would drag the end of the R down, and he would make a little, what, what's called a Hakenkreuz, or a swastika, on his signature on the paintings. and. That alone was enough to begin rumors about the provenance of, of the cadavers. Uh, once I heard that, I, I just really, really wanted to know what was the truth about this mm -hmm. atlas, having admired it so for much. For so long. So part of the reason for going to Munich uh, for that first sabbatical was I had the opportunity to be with the publisher of the Atlas for a year. And one of the artists who had worked on this book, the, the person that I thought was the best artist, was still alive. He was el an elderly man, but he, w he was alive and lived in the Anatomy Institute in Innsbruck. And I was able to uh, meet him. Uh, he didn't speak any English, but I was, I could speak German, having been in Hamburg before. And over a period of time, it took a few months, but over a period, he was very distrustful to me at first, but over a period of time, he, uh, we became friends. And, and I, I would stay in, in the Anatomy Institute for a week at a time, and then I would go back to Munich. We, our, our third child had been born that January in, in Munich, so my wife was home alone with 
the three children. But once I, I got his trust and we had this relationship, I, I started to ask him about the atlas and learned as much as I could from him. And that I still didn't know all the answers, but I had enough that I just kept going and uh, spent several years researching the atlas more and eventually wrote a, a paper about the atlas in which I said for the first time that one, all of the artists and the anatomists who had created the atlas were Nazis. And I gave this paper at an international congress on the history of medicine in Dusseldorf, and, and that created quite a bit of attention yeah. also, So, because no one had said this before. Even though there were people who, who knew this, uh, the Austrians had sort of swept this under the rug and you know, put the rug down. Um, so that's why mm. I, I went to Munich. Partly why I went to Munich. Sure. What year was it? Pu the was it published? The atlas, the original one. Well, the, the original atlas uh -huh. is a, is a it's it's a four uh, it's a four volume work made up of seven books, and the first uh, book or volume was published in 1937. Oh, okay. Uh, one year before the Anschluss, uh, and then, no, actually the first book was published in 33, 33, 37, and then another book was published uh, in, after the Anschluss, but before the end of the war, and then the fourth volume was published after the war. So the book that would be in question would be the, the work that was done uh, from the time of the Anschluss to the end of the Second World War. Oh, okay. And the, the, this whole thing developed into such a, a big deal. There, there was a, a, a large article in the New York Times about my research, and, and some other people got involved, and eventually we were able to force the University of Vienna to form a commission in their university senate that investigated the Anatomy Institute at, at Vienna from 1938 to 1945. And I worked with a number of those, a number of the faculty who were on that commission. Um, and then they, they published a report that, that uh, I have been quoted as saying, I, I have said at times that I, I, I think the report is somewhat of a whitewash. But there are members of that commission who, who are who are very good people. Mm. Um, not that the report exonerated the university, but uh, there are still some unanswered questions that might go unanswered forever. forever. Yeah, both things happen, don't yes. they? Yeah. All right. Huh. Um, do you have changing a little bit? The do you have any liaison with the medical, the statewide medical education, or are you just primarily in the vet school? I'm primarily in the veterinary school, but mm -hmm. what's interesting, when I first came to Purdue, I, I, I believe my salary was paid for by... Uh, Steve Beering started that satellite program mm -hmm. when he was the associate dean of the, of, uh, medical, school the medical school at IU. Because uh -huh. he was one of the first individuals that I met when I came. And I, I want to say that my salary, for a short time at least, was perhaps paid by, by the uh, medical school. But not 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 really sure. anymore. Okay. I, I, it's primarily the medical school then. Yes. Um, do you uh, do you do primarily the illustration or anything? Do you help with the faculty publications? I mean, do you do some illustrations for them as well? I still do. Okay. But I I, I think most of the illustrations that are created are used for teaching. Okay. Um, or perhaps both. It's just such a totally different thing today. We we have PowerPoint presentations and. Things are generated in such a way that that they'll be used in teaching in a PowerPoint presentation, and then some of those might be used in a in a publication. Yeah. Has the field changed somewhat since you've been here? Oh, drastically. And if so, can you make a couple of observations? It's very much driven by computer work, um, and in that regard, I'm somewhat of a dinosaur. Now, if I had to start all over again, of course, that's where I would sure. be. But I, I, I'm still very much a, a uh, 
uh, I su an old-fashioned artist. Right. I, I still do things by hand. The, the graduate students that I have immediately gravitate, not, not, not always, but almost immediately gravitate to the computer. And m many things are done on the computer uh -huh. today. It's another tool to use. Yes. Yeah, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. Um, tell us a little about your family. Um, did your children any go to Purdue or? Yes, Tell we have we have been blessed to have four wonderful children. Mm -hmm. Our oldest daughter is 35, and she is a Purdue graduate, uh, graduated in, in psychology, and her name is Lisa, and she works in Indianapolis. She's the uh, manager of the National Institute for Fitness and Sport. She always loved athletics. She grew up with Purdue athletics. She and I would walk to the basketball games. Was she? Did she participate, or was she a? a she was a very good athlete. She was a very good swimmer, and uh, even when she was young, I think she was swimming before she was walking. Just an excellent swimmer, but she loved Purdue basketball and football. Loved Jean Katie. Loves. I shouldn't put it in the past. Loves Jean Katie, and and sort of grew up with Purdue basketball. Sure. So I think her job at it's called NIFS. The acronym is NIFS. Allows her to be close to, because a lot of the, the professional athletes that come in Indianapolis to play the Colts or the Pacers will, will, will work out at NIFS for some reason. And it's just an in place for people, and so she gets to be Good, good context, yes. yeah, that's nice. And then our second daughter, Sarah, took a little while to get through Purdue, but part of that was because she had four majors. And she uh, uh, is working as a legislative assistant in uh, Congress in Washington, D.C., and lives in Old Town in Alexandria, Virginia. She's very much a Hoosier, would love to come back to Indiana, I think. And our third daughter, Anna, uh, graduated from DePauw with a degree in creative writing, and then worked for a law firm in uh, Chicago for two years, and we thought she was going to go to law school. But she changed her mind and got an MBA from IU and works for a company in New York City. Okay. And then our son, Matthew, uh, people think that I steered him to Michigan State. Uh, I did not. It's a long story as to why. But he wound up going to Michigan State and loved it. And he's very interested in film. Uh, he was a film, Michigan State has a, a rather unique film studies program in, in their English department. He graduated in three and a half years, and he works in New York City. Uh, right now he's working for a, a firm that does documentaries, and as we're doing this interview, he's in West Virginia working on a documentary. Oh, sounds good. We'll have to see some samples sometime. <laughs> now, you, may t you, know, you were also an author. Tell us a little about that uh, book you did, The Illustrated History of Veterinary Medicine. How that came about? That you got quite a few, quite a bit of recognition. Yes. Um, Did it take you a while to work on that. Oh yes. Oh. Yeah, that was four years of really intense work. Mosby, which is now, I believe, part of uh, Elsevier, as you would know this perhaps better than I, has bought up most of the other companies. But uh, Mosby uh, one, did a lot in, in, in publishing in the health sciences and had started with the illustrated history of medicine. Uh, and it, it, that, that is largely a, 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 a coffee table book. Um, but it, it's a well-known book, the history, an illustrated history of medicine, and then came the illustrated history of dentistry, and it, it developed into a series, the illustrated history of nursing, and I'm not sure how many other. Mm -hmm. They're in the series. Yes, and then when Mosby decided to get into the veterinary medicine area, the, the uh, person who was in charge of veterinary, uh, of that particular uh, section of Mosby, wanted to have an illustrated history of veterinary medicine. And so I honestly, I don't remember how we connected, but we did, and I met with him in Indianapolis, and I told him essentially how I would go about doing this book. Um, and they decided that they were going to get someone else to do the book, which was very upsetting, not only to myself, but 
to my dean at the time because he really wanted that book to come out of our school. Well, the book floundered for a couple of years. They, they just couldn't do the, the, the they couldn't get the, uh, they could not figure out how to do an illustrated book on veterinary medicine. And so they came back to my dean, who then came down to me at my, I'll never forget when he came to my office and he said, would you still like to do that book? And I said, of course. Um, and so I, went out to St. Louis, and, and the other author is Bob Dunlop, who had been the dean of the veterinary school at Minnesota. And we, we met and thought that we could work together. Bob's a pretty strong individual. He had his own ideas. And I'm a reasonably strong individual, and I had my own ideas. But we were, it was sort of a shotgun marriage, but we were able to work together. And that was sort of before the era of the internet, but I, or certainly the internet wasn't where it is today. And I had the idea that this whole thing could be done with a computer, not realizing that a lot of databases were not even thought of yet. But I went over to, uh, at that time it was called Puck, and told them what I wanted to do, and they, they designed a system, and I bought this computer, and the company paid for a graduate student who worked out of my office at home. And we quickly realized that we couldn't do this with a computer. So we did it the old-fashioned way. And I did an awful lot of traveling to libraries. Across the country. Literally all over the world. Oh. And, uh, and then I would make a list for Joanne, the graduate student, uh, who would come in the morning. And then she would call the various places, uh, say the Hermitage uh, in St. Petersburg, if I had identified a piece there that I thought would work. And Mosby was holding our feet to the fire because one of the flaws in, in the other books in the series is that uh, if we're talking about Catherine Marquis in the text, there might be a picture of someone else. And Mosby really wanted the, the uh, paintings and the various illustrations to really match the text. And that was somewhat of a challenge, but I would imagine um, to, to locate those. But but what I found was that the the book is called Veterinary Medicine: An, an Illustrated History. But in truth, it is a story of the human-animal bond, which begins with the cave art in, in the very early caves, uh, Chauvet and Lascaux. Um, and when you go to these places and you look at the paintings in the caves, what is it you see? You see drawings of animals. Okay. So man's fascination with animals started very early. And there, I, I found that there is just a plethora of art that could lend itself to this, this book. It was really more a matter, I looked at well over a million images and I got to the point where I could walk through, say the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., I could just walk through that in, in a few minutes. And I would spot a painting here, I'd spot a paint, painting there, and I, I would make a note. And then I would go back either in, through a book or some other source to look. Because I just couldn't spend a lot of time sure. in any one place. Um, but I, if anything, as I say, I, looked, I, I certainly looked at, at at least a million images. And it was really more, the challenge was which ones would really fit well with the book. What would be the match for yes. it? So yeah. I, I, I'm very, very proud of that book. It's the f only work of its kind in English, and it's... Has it been translated? No, oh. it has not. Mm -hmm. But it is cited quite often. I, I added a journal on veterinary history, uh, which is, and then it's actually produced here at Purdue University, and, and I, I, no, seeing the papers that are published, I know that the work is cited quite often. What about your co-author? Did uh, what was his involvement as well? Doing similar things that you were? No, oh. uh, Bob. Well, Bob was interested in in the art program, of course. But Bob was more. He is a veterinarian, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, he's uh, he's English. Uh, and went to veterinary school at uh, Glasgow, and he has more of an interest in 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 the actual history. The, 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 the written part. Now we worked on that together. I, I, was, I would sort of edit what, it, what he wrote. Um, 
but he, he was he's a prodigious writer and one of the most brilliant men I've ever encountered in my life. The first time I visited Bob in St. Paul, I'll never forget it. He, he has a lovely home. There's a, a part of St. Paul that it, it reminds me of Hills and Dales here in West Lafayette. Uh, and I, I believe the land is owned by the University of Minnesota, and there must be some kind of an arrangement for you, you buy this beautiful home, but you don't really own the land. The land is owned by the university. And I went to his house, and every room in that house was filled with books, just stacks of books everywhere. And y you could bring up something to Bob, and he would think for a moment, he'd go racing through the room, and he would go to a stack of books, and he would pull a book out from the bottom of the stack, and it would be the book that was <laughs> needed. For, he just knew every book. <laughs> he looked at them very carefully before he selected he them, so he, and before he shelved them, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Bob is still alive and doing doing well. Mm -hmm. I see him occasionally at meetings. And do you? That's mm -hmm. nice. What was campus the uh, campus like when you came in the seventies? Tell us a little bit about it. Well, it was not quite compared bit, to today. Quite a bit different than it is today. There's been a remarkable change for the better at Purdue, for sure. I, I remember remarking to my wife when we came to Purdue in February of seventy-three, uh, and, and I. And I I'm prejudiced. I, I think Michigan State is a very beautiful campus, and I, 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 uh, I, I'm prejudiced. But I remember remarking to Andrew after being here for a short time, I said, as soon as I get tenure, we're leaving. <laughs> and then I got tenure right away, and then I said, well, we'll go on sabbatical for a year, and then we'll leave. It's 30, more we're than still here. We're moving later. forward. <laughs> right. You've, you've been involved in the university and senate committees too, haven't you? And school committees, any comment yes, on that? Yes, I, I have enjoyed uh, my, a long tenure in the university senate. Uh, I'm currently the chair of the faculty affairs committee uh, in the senate, and I enjoy that very much. Uh, there are just many aspects of what would affect faculty, faculty concerns that, that will find their way to the Faculty Affairs Committee. Uh, and the provost is on the committee. Last year, we, uh, I presented the uh, parental leave, paid parental leave policy. Uh, this is something that Purdue does not have. Most, if not all, the other Big Ten school, our peer institutions do. And that was passed unanimously in the Senate. And there were a number of other bills that we, mm -hmm. we presented in the Senate that were passed. I, I enjoy that very much. Yeah. It's a good, good opportunity then. Mm -hmm. This now, year, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, we're already working the, this summer on, uh, th there is widespread concern on campus, uh, especially on the part of junior faculty about interdisciplinary research and, and being recognized for promotion and tenure for their interdisciplinary research. Primary committees are having a difficult time evaluating interdisciplinary research. And so a lot of junior faculty feel that they're not being rewarded or being given tenure for what they're doing. Interdisciplinary research is now part of the new strategic plan. It's being encouraged. So what we're doing, we're studying this whole issue, and hopefully we will have uh, this next uh, academic year some guidelines that we can present to primary, that primary committees can use to help them in deciding or, or in evaluating interdis interdisciplinary research. Sure. Well, that's good. It, it, is, it is a problem. Yes. And now, with so much of it going on, the interdisciplinary research, you know, yes. campus-wide. Yeah. Uh, professional associations, are you, have, are you involved in, uh, what's your, what uh, association do you belong to? Is there a medical illustration one? There's the Association okay. of Medical Illustrators, and for m many years I was very active in, 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 in the AMI, served on the Board of Governors, uh, and on a number of other committees. I'm a member of the American Association for the History of Medicine, uh, and enjoy that. I'm also a member of the uh, American Veterinary Medical History Society, which I enjoy. Again, that history thing keeps coming out. and. Uh, and I'm also, I said earlier, I'm the editor of, of the journal that is the bulletin for the, for the uh, s Society for 
veterinary history. Good, very good. Now I want to talk about the University of Cambridge, your the fellowship. And just mention a little bit about it. Uh, and then hopefully when you come back, you'll tell us a little bit about what the, your experience was. For our researchers, tell them about this is very nice. It, it is like a dream come true. Uh, I visited Cambridge. I gave a lect two lectures at Cambridge uh, for the first time in 1990. Uh, and sort of like the atlas I talked about earlier, mm -hmm. I, I fell in love with Cambridge. And I've, I, every opportunity I get, I go back to Cambridge. My favorite, or one, one of my best student, well, just an incredible student, uh, some years back, lives with his wife and their two children uh, just outside of Cambridge. Uh, I was recently offered and accepted a, a visiting fellowship uh, at the University of Cambridge, which will, uh, uh, is, that, that, that's important to me for many reasons. I, I'm very honored to be given that, but it, it will allow my wife and I to have the opportunity of living in college for six months, and that's an experience I really very much want to have. And just the opportunity of being a fellow. Uh, and then at the same time, I will be a visiting scholar in the Department of the History and Philosophy of Science and Medicine at Cambridge. And it's there where I'll carry out some of my research. Uh, there, there are other things that I want to do in the library. The Darwin Library has an extensive collection of very rare anatomical atlases. And I want to have the opportunity to study these atlases. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to this. I would say so. It's a wonderful very opportunity. Very much. Uh, you got an outstanding event in your life that you'd like to make a comment on? Well, Catherine, there have been so many. <laughs> I, I don't know the, which one. You I had would. some other one, uh, then some topics that you wanted to elaborate a little bit on for the researchers. They were talking about the campus and also the figure in front of the school. Some clo some, some general comments. I'd well, say. one of the things that I yeah. think uh, has. It certainly improved at, at Purdue. There, there's still room for growth, and, and I made a comment with, with the Tiger Group on the strategic plan about campus planning, is uh, the placement of sculpture on campus. And I was involved with the, uh, the, uh, the continuum, which is a series of sculptures in front of Lynn Hall, the veterinary school, along Harrison Street. And that was a wonderful experience. And in that whole process, I, I got to know the artist very well, Larry Anderson from Spokane, Washington, uh, and his wife Cheryl. And they, they, are ver they're, they became very good friends of ours. And uh, that was just a wonderful experience. I, I, I think that that's a beautiful piece of sculpture. For the researchers, uh, tell them how that came about, that the, uh, how the sculpture was, came about to the school. Uh, I th as I recall, it was uh, Hugh Lewis, when Hugh Lewis was our dean and, and Al Rebar uh, had the idea of, after we did the addition to Lynn Hall, which enlarged the library and created the teaching hospital, we had that large expanse along Harrison Street and it was sort of naked and was just begging for some piece of art. And Hugh Lewis was somewhat of, was a visionary and thought that a sculpture in that area would would would, would work, and we did have a a competition and, and looked at a number of portfolios, uh, but to me, when I, I I didn't know Larry Anderson at the time, but when I saw Larry's work. And then certainly after he came to the school and pr made his presentation and showed us what he thought would, what he wanted to do, there was no question in my mind but th that he was the person to get to the commission. Yeah. For the researchers who, they'll see this but may, may not have seen it, particular com um, what are some pieces that make up the sculpture for the continuum? Uh, the continuum is, uh, I don't know the exact number of pieces, but there's there's a, a wall that is represented. I, 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 Larry was given a copy of my book, and I, I think I don't. I, I'm not going to say that he got the idea by looking at the book, but it, it begins with a, 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 
like a segment out of one of the uh, early caves right. with cave art, like something like they've taken a wall out of Lascaux or, or Chauvet. And then there is a horse, uh, there's a cat, there's a pig, there is a, uh, a young female veterinarian who's uh, listening to a heart on, on a dog. There's the scientist who's looking at some test tubes. And then a young, it ends with a young boy uh, running with his dog. Yes. Nice. It's very, very nice. I it's research, if you come to campus, you'll enjoy looking at it. Yeah. It's a lovely piece. Yes, it is. Now some closing comments that you'd like to share for the researchers, something that you'd like to summarize, anything particular? If you look back and look ahead, or both? Well, it certainly has been an incredible, uh, I hate to say, just an incredible ride. I, when I said earlier that I told my wife when we first came to Purdue that I, I wanted to leave, thank God I didn't leave. I, I, I love Purdue, and I've loved my time here. There have been some ups, there have been some downs, but I, I have enjoyed my career. I, I've done things that I never in a million years thought I would be doing, uh, and things have happened in my career that I never, ever thought would happen. And I, they might have happened somewhere else, but they happened here. And Purdue is definitely my home. Thank you very much, David. This concludes the interview. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kat. <laughs>